Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right. My name is Alicia Boone Jean Noel, and I am the manager of adult programs here at the Brooklyn Museum. On behalf of our institution, I'd like to thank you for joining us in person and via live stream for tonight's program. At this moment, we are standing together in solidarity with Penn American Center, the International Literature Festival Berlin, and hundreds of individuals from around the world in a reading for Ashraf Faid. We are grateful to Penn American Center for working with the Brooklyn Museum to co-present such a timely and important program. I'd like to thank our director, Ann Pasternak, for her trailblazing leadership, along with our Vice Director of Education and Programming, Radia Harper, and our adult programs team, Lauren Zelaya, Catherine um, Fine, Claire Kissinger, Lena Sawyer, and Omolo Babatunde, as well as our audiovisual technology and public information team for making tonight's program a reality. Uh, Clarice and I, sorry, I'm a little bit emotional because tonight's pro this is a program, but it's very, very emotional. I just feel totally moved and I expressed this a lot um, before I got up here. It's just a lot. This, isn't, this is not just a, another run of the mill program. So thank you very much for standing in solidarity with us. Art has the power to bring people together and create cross-cultural connections and understandings. As displayed in our agitprop exhibition on the fourth floor of this museum, we can see that there are countless key moments in history where artists have reached beyond museums and galleries to use their work as an opportunity to call action and create political and social change. Tonight, the Brooklyn Museum is joining individuals from all across the world, like I said, that care about justice and freedom of expression in support of Ashraf. For those of you that don't know, he's a Palestinian poet who has been sentenced to death in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in November of last year. Um, Clarice and I met each other at the Prop exhibition opening in the middle of December and saw this as an opportunity for our institutions to collaborate with one another. So I'm very grateful and honored to introduce her to you so she can give you a little bit more information about our collab collaboration tonight as well as um, what we're facing here in Saudi Arabia. So I hope that you will continue to use your voice and your art as a tool for social change and expression. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Clarice Sharif. Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. And uh, I think that uh, I'm equally thankful to Alicia to say yes. So I thought this program should be, take place in Brooklyn. I'm biased, I live in Brooklyn, okay? Uh, but it should take place in, a, in a, suiting, a suited place, and I think Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Museum is the right place for this time to, uh, to um, you know, stand uh, together with these writers who face great danger. Um, and so uh, to um, reach out to the Brooklyn Museum and to get a resounding yes please come, let's collaborate, was uh, fantastic. So as Alicia said, I'm uh, Clarice. Um, I'm the Deputy Director of Public Programs for Pan American Center. And uh, tonight's uh, reading is for um, a multi-talented uh, artist, a poet, an artist, a curator, Ashra Fayyad. Um, I wanted to point out before uh, I talk about uh, Penn that the images that you saw while we were uh, waiting for the program to start are photographs by were that were taken by Ashraf and posted on his Instagram account. And I think it gives us a window in terms of, uh, in into his sensibility maybe as an artist, as a photographer. Um, and I thought that was important to uh, kind of uh, paint a whole picture of who we are um, uh, celebrating tonight. A couple of months ago, the International Literature Festival Berlin called on all individuals and institutions that care about justice and, justice and freedom to participate in a worldwide reading. So as we stand here tonight, there are more than 120 readings in 43 countries, drawing attention to the ongoing risk of execution faced by Ashraf Fayyad. 
He is not the only one, unfortunately, facing such dire threats, as proves uh, the recent troubling news about the killings of 47 Saudi prisoners and yesterday's arrest and release of human rights lawyer Samar Badawi. I will let my colleague Karen tell you more about uh, Ashraf's case and similar cases. And so quickly, I wanted to, for those of you who do not know Pan American Center, I wanted to let you know about who we are. We are the largest branch of the world's leading international literary and human rights organization. Pen is also a membership organization of over 4,300 writers, editors, translators, and publishers. If you're already a member, thank you for your support. If you're interested in our work, please uh, talk to me, talk to my colleagues here tonight, and we'll tell you more about how you can help support uh, our work and get engaged. We offer a wide range of programs, such as public programs, uh, the Literary Awards Program, the Prison Writing Program, the World Voices Festival of International Literature that happens every spring in New York City, and many advocacy and anti-censorship campaigns. So tonight, we celebrate and take a stand for free expression, creative freedom, and human rights. And we're so happy that you came out and, uh, stand, and are standing with us. The format of the event is simple. We'll hear about a little bit more about Ashraf Fayyad's case. And uh, our co-host will introduce our wonderful cast of readers. And uh, this will be followed by the readings. At the end of the program, don't forget to uh, stick around and see the exhibition upstairs, Agit Prop. Um, also, uh, take a moment to tell your friends and tweet about uh, this event to uh, keep uh, the case alive. Use free Ashraf as a hashtag. So I want to thank uh, quickly our readers, Natalie Diaz, Dorania Freeman, Dred Scott, Lawrence Joseph, Dina Moore, Daniel Skombeck, and Ruth Freeman. They all, they all also said yes when we reached out to them, and they were all so honored to be able to participate tonight, and I'm thankful to them. We have uh, our co-host tonight for the evening, Elisa Chappelle and Rob Spillman. Elisa is a, a short story writer, editor, and essayist. She's the co-founder of a literary magazine, Tin House, and editor at large. She's also a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. And Rob Spillman is editor of Tin House magazine and editorial advisor of Tin House Books. He's a contributor of book reviews and essays to Salon and Book Forum. So now we'll get started. Please welcome my colleague, Karen Kolkar, Director of Free Expression. Thank you very much for coming again. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, I'm so honored to be here tonight to help set the stage for this evening of readings in solidarity with Ashraf Fayyad, a poet, artist, and curator of Palestinian origin who, as you've heard, is currently facing a death sentence in Saudi Arabia. As uh, the director of PAN America's free expression program, I wanted to set the stage a bit by discussing current restrictions on expression in Saudi Arabia, talking about Ashraf's case, and highlighting the types of work PAN does to help writers at risk. PAN regularly engages in advocacy on cases like Ashraf's. Publicly, we issue press statements, disseminate information via social media channels, organize joint sign-on letters to pressure governments or other powerful actors, or meet with officials to express our concerns. Privately, we assist individuals who are facing the risk of imprisonment or attack as a result of their creative expression, um, both in the US, around the world, offering practical assistance when we can, or even simply connections to others who can help them and their families. Penn's case list at the moment is comprised of more than 900 writers worldwide, so we're kept very busy. We became involved in Fayyad's case in mid-November, shortly after we learned of his death sentence, when we joined with Penn Centers and writers worldwide to send joint letters to the Saudi government to protest this harsh sentence. Penn also enlisted prominent American writers to send a joint letter to President Obama, asking the US government to speak out about his case with their Saudi counterparts. And as you've heard, following an appeal by the International Literature Festival in Berlin, we have joined the call to, the, to hold this series of worldwide readings to join attention to his case and to highlight the solidarity felt by writers around the world for Ashraf. 
Fayyad's case originally began in 2013, and after a series of arrests, detentions, charges, and drawn-out judicial proceedings, he was sentenced to death for, by beheading for apostasy in November 2015, in part because of supposedly blasphemous themes contained in a 2008 poetry collection called Instructions Within. He appealed the sentence in mid-December, and the petition is currently being considered by the Saudi court, so we could be hearing any day about the final verdict. Unfortunately, Ashraf's case is not unique. Conditions for free speech are particularly restrictive in Saudi Arabia, and authorities have tightened their control over expression in the past few years by clamping down on dissent and nonconformist religious beliefs in the country. In February 2013, a sweeping anti-terrorism law took effect that allowed the authorities to press for terrorism charges for anyone who demanded political reform, exposed corruption and unjust practices, or, or simply exercised the right to freedom of expression. A new law in April 2014 decreed atheism to be a crime punishable by up to 20 years in prison. Apostasy remains on the books as an offense punishable by death, and that's the sentence that Ashraf has been given. Print and broadcast media content is tightly controlled by the authorities and royal family, and digital media, for example, internet websites and blogs are also heavily regulated, with more than 400,000 websites blocked if they have content that the authorities deem to be either immoral or politically sensitive. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, as of the end of 2015, there were seven writers in prison in Saudi Arabia, most on anti-state charges. In addition to hearing Ashraf's work tonight, we'll, we'll also be hearing the works of several other poets and writers fa facing lengthy jail sentences or serving prison terms in the region, including Raif Badawi, a Saudi blogger, activist, and creator of the website Free Saudi Liberals, sentenced to 10 years in prison, 1,000 lashes, and a fine, in addition to a 10-year travel ban after his sentence expires. Luckily, he has only received 50 lashes out of that 1,000 lash sentence. Uh, Muhammad al a Qatari poet serving 15 years in prison after a secret trial in 2012 on charges of criticizing the emir in a poem. And Fatima Ektasari, an Iranian poet sentenced in October 2015 to 11 and a half years in prison and 99 lashes for her poetry, which was interpreted as insulting the sacred and even for shaking hands with male writers and international literary events. Penn has been involved in advocacy on behalf of these individuals, and we hope that this reading will help shine the spotlight on their cases, as well as to showcase their literary work. Please visit our website at www.penn.org, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, sign up for our weekly newsletter to stay informed, or even donate to our emergency funds that help writers like Ashraf who are facing very severe threats. Um, thank you very much, and now I'd like to introduce our, our literary co-hosts for the evening, Rob Spillman and Elisa Chappelle. Thank you. Oh, hey. Good evening. It is so nice to see so many of you here this evening. Um, Robbie and I both feel uh, extremely honored to be a part of this evening's event. As writers and literary citizens of a country that counts Saudi Arabia as a friend and longtime ally, we have the power and the obligation to call upon our government to use their considerable influence to stop the execution of Ashraf Fayyad. Ashraf, artist, curator, and poet, for years has been considered the unofficial ambassador for Saudi Arabia's burgeoning contemporary art world instrumental in introducing Saudi artists to Western audiences around the, and other, I'm sorry, I'm a little upset too, and look at this. A little verklempt. Um, he has been instrumental in introducing Saudi artists to Western audiences. There's a sick irony in Fayyad, a poet who seeks to map the very essence of the human experience in the shared territories um, being persecuted in this way and being a victim of his country's most barbaric practices. And we as citizens and artists cannot look away. Living in the United States, it's very easy for us to tell ourselves that we don't have to do anything to get involved. 
because we reason we live in a modern civilized world and writers and artists and public figures are not jailed or beheaded for expressing their opinion. This is what we tell ourselves perhaps so that we can sleep at night. Perhaps so that some of us can make art and write about it. I don't know about you, but today when I was thinking about coming here, I was thinking about how I feel that an artist has a moral obligation to write about the truth and to write about their, to write about their personal experiences in the most honest way possible. And I couldn't imagine what it was like for Ashraf right now not only to be in prison counting days, but also what it must be like to be deprived of that ability to process your emotions and write down what you're feeling most passionately. Um, that's a terrifying place to be in. So I want to say tonight that, speaking for Robbie and myself, um, it's an honor to be a part of this evening and in doing so to expect, accept the responsibility um, and take up the mantle to protect freedom of speech all over the country and particularly tonight for Fayad. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So it is my pleasure to uh, give brief introductions to the readers tonight, and uh, I'm going to introduce all of them in a row so that Ashraf's work can be heard and other writers' work can be heard so uninterrupted. So I'm going to introduce in order. So first up is Natalie Diaz, who is a member of the Mojave and Pima Indian tribes, who is a poet language activist and educator. She will be followed by Duranya Freeman, who has worked as a journalist for Sri Lanka's The Nation and is a staff writer for two of Colorado College's student publications where she is a freshman. She will be followed by Dred Scott, who is a photographer, performance artist, and provocateur who makes revolutionary art to propel history forward and is part of the uh, amazing Agitprop exhibition here, which is open after this. He will be followed by Lawrence Joseph, who is the grandson of Lebanese and Syrian Catholic immigrants and is a poet and professor of law who holds both a BA and JD from the University of Michigan and a second BA and MA from Cambridge University, making us all feel like slackers. He will be followed by Dina Omar, who is a writer and graduate student in medical anthropology at Yale University. She's a founding member of the National Students for Justice in Palestine and served as the National Executive Board for the Palestinian Youth Movement. She will be followed by Daniel Schunebeck, who is a, an American poet, and his first book of poems, American Barricade, was published by Yes Yes Books in 2014. He will, and lastly, will, is Rue Freeman, who is a Sri Lankan-born writer and activist. She is the author of the novels A Disobedient Girl and On Salmalane, as well as the amazing anthology, and the editor of the amazing anthology, Extraordinary Rendition, American Writers on Palestine, which came out this year from OR Books. So please welcome our first reader, Natalie Diaz. Thank you. I want to thank you for your time. I'm each Tanum, Natalie Mulk. Tonight we will all return to our homes. I will walk down a street lined with lights, take from my pocket a key that fits a door I will open, onto a room with a table of fruit and wine, a desk to build my altar of books, a basin, soap, clean water to wash my face. And in a mirror above those, my face will be reflected back to me. And I will know, life, you have not left me. We, I, am still here. Later, my lover will draw the blinds and lift my shirt, undress me, will hold my sad head in her hands, and tell me a story of what this body is for, to live, to pray only desire and joy, to call one another by name. What is more tender than to be called by a lover? I do not know what it is to die for something. In poetry, a man, a woman should live. To Ashraf, I say, kimemeram, kithper tahanam, chukwar mermerem. I'm reading a poem translated by Fadi Juda. Ashraf's Frida Kahlo's mustache. 
I will ignore the smell of clay, the reproach of rain, and the choke that has long settled in my chest. And I will search for an appropriate condolence of my situation that doesn't permit me to explain your lips in the manner I'd hoped for, or to shake dewdrops off your reddish petals, or to lessen the intensity of the obsession that overwhelms me when I realize you're not next to me now and won't be. I'm forced to justify my position to the silence that night punishes me with. Pretend that the earth is silent just as we see it from afar, and that all what happened between us was no more than a poor prank that shouldn't have gone this far. What's your idea about the days I usually spend with you? About my words that used to rapidly evaporate about my heavy pain? And the knots that had sedimented inside my thorax like dried up algae? I forgot to tell you that in the practical sense of the word, I've grown used to your absence, and that my wishes have lost their way to your desires, and my memory has begun to corrode, and that I still chase light, not because I want to see. The dark always frightens, even when we are used to it. Is my apology for everything that happened while I was trying to make up excuses enough for you? Is it enough for the times jealousy raged in some place inside me, or when disappointment ruined yet another of my dark days? And for my repetition that justice will always suffer the disturbances of menstruation, and that love is a backward, impotent man at the end of his days. I will be forced to trick my memory and pretend that I have no problem sleeping and rip all the remaining questions, the questions that now search for persuasive answers after all punctuation has been dropped for purely personal reasons. Let the mirror explain to you how beautiful you are. Remove my pile of dust, my words breathe deeply. Remember how much I loved you and how the whole thing turned into a brief electrocution that almost caused a great fire and an empty warehouse. The sun is extremely polite when it comes to covering her mouth while yawning. The sun doesn't know how to impose its total control over the earth. The same fate the sun has with darkness. The sun has no choice but to resist the dark, even if Pluto has lost its qualifications to remain among the vertiginous planets. The moon has a different take on imposing its will over the sea, and the sea can swallow whatever creatures it desires and lay claim to more land on account of global warming the punctured ozone, a woman's right to wear a bikini, and the temptation of birds with the riches of fish. I will no longer be pain pills for your monthly period and won't enjoy your exceptional conversation while you prepare for a long nap or when you want to offload your anger or while you spend some lovely time in a bar packed with lovers of jazz. I won't be able to sleep enough or explain Nietzsche's mustache or persuade you that Imad's work is a unique experiment in art. I will busy myself with normalizing relations between earth and water in order to obstruct fire on its way to becoming an ambassador of goodwill. Only then will the air cease to appear presentable as it dries out your underwear on the laundry line. I walk in the street of the inexpressible and question the indifferent raindrops. I try to remove the rust that's stuck in my throat. How many times should I refer to the wind's guidebook to decipher your moods? How many words have I silenced to spare you the smell of disappointment that my American cigarette blows? I won't be the piggy bank you break whenever you run out of funds, and I won't include as poetic chore an amorous description of your eyes, 
because your eyes in the final analysis are more fatal than those that ruin Jarir's mind or mo more poetic than Sayab's palm tree groves. Your eyes are precisely the way angels prostrated to Adam and I exclude Satan naturally for rhetorical reasons. The world this morning resembles my stomach with its ulcers, resembles the ache that it spends its weekends in my head, resembles the heaps of broken glass that fill my memory. The world is no longer all right since I've stopped worrying about glass, or the reply letter to my letter, or Mrs. Clinton's failure to lead the Democratic Party. Don't look for me. I will be there with every sip of coffee. And, you relax, and when you relax at a spa or want to laugh or cry, or if you desire to toss yourself into someone's arms, or when you can't resist your insomnia or your mobile phone that didn't ring during your sleep, or when in the unconsciousness of writing, or when you want to talk or while watching a movie regardless of its quality, and when you tickle the ground as you walk exercise Exercise, and when you hear our song, the one we have yet to agree on. Good evening. So standing up here as a college sophomore, it's difficult not to feel very overwhelmed by all the other writers here, who obviously have a lot more experience than I do. But my piece in my mother's anthology, um, I wrote about speaking out and the importance of that, um, no matter how young you are, um, which is why I'm so grateful to be a part of this important event today. I'm honored to be reading the poem Run by Iranian poet Fatima Ektasari. Um, who has recently received a very harsh prison sentence for his own artistic expression a few short months ago. And like Fayad's case, Penn has been following this case and circulating a petition calling for the nullification of his sentence. Run, a voice passed by me, and someone just ran inside my confused mind. Run, the streets were crowded and crowded. Run, the cars were honking in an endless night honking after many years of forgetfulness, entering my ear and confusing my mind. I heard them honking, and I kept a torn up picture in my hands. I heard the sound of being lost in all the dead end streets. I heard the sound of tears slipping down the rocked eyes. I heard the sound of tear gas and cigarettes all stinging. I heard the sound of batons meeting backs and heads. And I heard the shadows running behind me Run. Two silences made a voice, the voice of our hands, separated from each other, the voice of yours, passing by me, the voice of yours, becoming the voice of the people, and the voice of mine, lost in all those bad days. I was sticking to a postern, sticking to my office, to my job, sticking to my pills and all those nights of insomnia, and sticking to all those duplicated mornings. I used to wake up and practice my laughs and practice my cries with a duplicated mirror. I used to put my impatient signature in the bottom official papers. I used to look for one thing in all the newspapers impatiently. And I used to come back from the office in all the afternoons of impatience, coming back to the silence that welcomes you in every room, coming back to the cold hands that keep up the hot cup of tea, coming back to the bad days followed by worse, and coming back to me, waiting to welcome my husband, like a happy wife who waits to welcome her husband, waiting for him to throw his socks in the living room. Run. My house is filled with the thrown away sounds. Run. Someone touched my shoulder. You should run to the streets of Madding Crowd and to a woman in Arabian Vale. You should run to those two shadows behind you, and to the fear of keeping a green wristband in your hand. You should run to yourself, stung by a hot bullet, and to your fingers of the V-sign. You should run to the clotting blood in the corner of our lips, and to the night which is our sad resumption, to the incomplete night of liberty, and to yourself dying in my arms, to yourself being alive among the deads, and to our hands meeting each other again. Call me, I am you. 
I am as cold as your hands. Call me. I want to come back to the streets. Call me. To whisper in your ears with love. Call me. To lose myself in your arms and in my dreams. Come back and resurrect the memories. Call me. And rescue me from myself. Thank you. Good evening. Um, it's, standing here and seeing so many people out here is very, it's wonderful that we're here and it's horrible that we have to be here. I do want to say that it is, who, you know, who wants to live in a world where people are sentenced to death supposedly because they don't believe in a God or the right God? And who wants to live in a country that supports regimes like Egypt or Israel or Saudi Arabia that militarily and politically backs people, regimes where they sentence people to death for not believing in the right God. We need revolution. So, um, I will be reading the, the, a poem by Rafe Badawi. Um, the poem is entitled, A Thousand Lashes Because I Say What I Think. Um, and preceding this, uh, well, it's not a poem, it's an essay. Um, and preceding this, the translator of it said, in 2012, Saudi blogger Raif Badawi was arrested for insulting Islam through electronic channels. In his blog post, Badawi had called for the separation of church and state, advocated for the equality of all religions, and condemned religious extremism. As a consequence, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison and a thousand lashes. His controversial blog post, included the, introduced by this essay, have been published by Greystone Books. Proceeds from a thousand lashes because I say what I think will go to Badawi's family and their efforts to procure his release. I was engrossed in my attempts to re-examine liberalism in Saudi Arabia, which I was contributing to the prevalence of the enlightenment in my con community. I wanted to break the walls of ignorance, to shatter the sacredness of religious clerics. I wanted to advocate for change and respect for freedom of speech, to call for women and minorities' rights, and the rights of the indigent in Saudi Arabia. That was before I was jailed in 2012. Imagine living your daily life, enacting all of its details, in a small 215 square foot room, accompanied by more than 30 people accused of a variety of criminal activities. In prison, I socialized with people confined for criminal offenses, killers, thieves, drug lords, and pedophiles. My interactions with them altered many of my fault but faulty understandings in regard to this world of criminals. Before my imprisonment, like any other person, I would go to bed after I checked all the windows and doors in my home for fear of criminals. Now I lived amongst them. I slept, ate, showered, changed my clothes, celebrated and cried, got angry, laughed out loud, and screamed my lungs out, all while surrounded by their leering eyes. After colossal efforts and countless attempts to acclimate myself to them, I focused on changing my way of seeing them. I pulled the curtain from the other side and started to explore the depths of their world. It took me a while, but I came to the conclusion that criminals laugh too. Yes, they fall in love, feel pain, and are capable of deep, soft human emotions. It is agonizing for me to compare those genuine feelings I witnessed with the negative perceptions of people I considered close to me in the past. In the prison lavatory, I took a look around me, only to find some filthy tissues and excrement everywhere. It was a staggering situation. The walls were soiled. The doors were rusty and rotten. Here I was, trying to adapt to this new chaos. My eyes scanned the walls around me. Reading the hundreds of sentences written on the sticky walls, my eyes caught an unexpected sentence. Secularism is the solution. I rubbed my eyes with both palms. For a second, I didn't believe what I was seeing. I wanted to be sure that I was indeed reading with my eyes were looking about, locked upon. I escaped my reality for a second. I felt like I was standing in the middle of a dirty old nightclub in a poor neighborhood. By the wee hours of the night, a beautiful mesmerizing woman walks in. She fills the nightclub with a stunning joy and life energy. I hardly knew what made me think of that, why I was pulled into this fantasy. It seems that the change of toilet seat played a major role in the way I made sense of this new, strange life I was living. 
I smiled. I wondered who the person was, anyway, I wondered who the person might be who wrote such a sentence, in a prison filled to the walls with thousands of prisoners, all jailed because of criminal activities. My astonishment was equal only to my happiness at reading such a short, beautiful, and different sentence. The sentence stood alone among dozens of obscenities that were written in so many different Arabic dialects. This discovery could only mean one thing. There was at least one other person here who understood me, who understood the reason I was jailed and the goals I was hoping to accomplish. In the following days, I started to see a whole different reality that turned this world of criminals into my own personal paradise. I built the heaven according to my own standards. I detailed it according to a new set of beliefs that departed from all my previous life experiences before my imprisonment. Yes, lavatory cell number five really touched me. When my dear wife, Insaf, told me a large publishing house in Germany was interested in collecting my articles in a book translated into German, I hesitated. I will be completely honest with you. When I wrote my first article, I couldn't imagine it would be gathered in a book of Arabic, let alone translated into a different language. Well, if you picked up this book, managed to read this far, and you're still going, I can safely assume that you, my dear reader, are interested in reading what I have to say. Some think that I have something to say. Others think that I am an ordinary man with nothing to share, a man who doesn't deserve his writings to be collected in books or translated for the world to share. However, when I look within, I only see that thin man who miraculously withstood 50 lashes while a group of people celebrated his pain, repeatedly chanting, Alu Akbar. All for the articles you are about to read. Yes, I was accused of apostasy, the conscious abandonment of Islam, and sentenced to death. The sentence was then reduced to 10 years of imprisonment, as well as 1,000 lashes. I was also required to pay a million Saudi rials in financial punishment. I spent three years writing these articles for you. I was tortured. My wife and our three children had to immigrate from our country because of the many pressures placed upon them. My family and I endured all those harsh struggles simply because I spoke my mind. We went through these hardships for the sake of every letter written in this book. On November 29, 2012, the criminal court in Doha convicted Mohammed al ajami for inciting the overthrow of the ruling regime and criticizing the emir for two of his poems and sentenced him to life in prison in a two-line judgment. The poet was not present for the decision. His sentence was later reduced to 15 years on appeal on February 25, 2013. That sentence was confirmed by Qatar's Supreme Court on October 21, 2013, despite arguments that the charges and trial were deeply flawed. He has no further legal recourse in the courts. El Ajami has been held in solitary confinement in Doha Central Prison since his arrest with extremely limited visitation rights in violation of United Nations principles. On October 23, 2013, representatives from Pan American Center were prevented from visiting him despite having been told their visit had been approved. This is Mohammed al-Ajami's poem, Poem from a Prison Cell. Poem from a Prison Cell. Is it my mind or my heart that I've lost to you, Arab lands, home of enemies? If you held our minds with law and reason, if you respected our opinions, then you'd hold my heart as well. Who am I? Don't ask the days about me. I'm nothing but a prisoner in an isolation cell. Here in my country, oppression is what takes our rights away. Here, ignorance determines our convictions. Here, 
the people no longer have a voice, cannot spell out the language of reproach. My country, if insight required an apology, I'd never stop apologizing. Tell your children, east and west, and keep telling them until the birds sing it in the branches. That a people without opinions is nothing but a herd that's thirsty yet blind to the nearby oasis. Fight for your convictions. This is how you ride your steeds and bear your arms against a ruler who seeks to oppress and who molds your silence into a pretext for injustice. Tell them that I, stubborn, persistent, was unmatched in my victory and my defeat. Time may have disgraced me, but I haven't been easy for time to shackle. Lord of rabble, what of yours compares to the thrones of Emmet Odd's people in Aram, the city of pillars, which God spoke of in his revelation? You've been insincere, a false prophet on earth, though you, like Jesus, spoke in the crib. You wounded truth, and my proud allegiance is lifeless now and clad in black. How can you expect obedience when you call for injustice? If we obeyed you, then what would become of our principles? When we pray, who do we pray to? To God or to God's servants? There's no room for virtue under oppression. There's no room for vice on the road of justice. Whoever wrongs and deceives his people will never be able to guide them. If history were objective, it would tell how you've sought glory in my so-called enmity. Go ahead and be miserable, though you and I are not enemies. I avoid enmity and make enemies only of those who are truly worthy. If you ask after my finest day, on an occasion when words of pride are called for, I'd call history to mind and say it was when I was a prisoner in my own country, from when you shackled my wrists. History gave me strength and confidence in victory. These distasteful chains are power in my hands, not power for those who lord it over me. Doors and guards wake me up gently whenever I sleep too long. Is it not desire but fear that makes me ask this? Fear that the enemies will see my weakness when I sleep? Though I no longer know if my eyes are closed or if I've been awake all this time. Kanaha 
الشوري وردها في حكايات الجدة انتهى الدرس الأول Asylum To stand at the end of a queue To be given a morsel of bread To stand Something your grandfather used to do without knowing the reason why The morsel You the homeland, a card you put in your wallet. Money, papers that carry the images of leaders. The photo, your substitution pending your return. And the return, a mythological creature from your grandmother's tales. End of the first lesson. Sorry, I'm really nervous. Um, so that was a poem by Ashraf Fayyad um, in both Arabic and English. Um, it's the first time I read a poem in Arabic in Fusha out loud in a crowd, so um, I hope I didn't mess it up too bad. <laughs> Um, so I was going to read a poem that they asked me to read, but now I want to read a different poem. And I'm nervous because reading Ashraf Fayyad's poems over the last few weeks has been incredibly illuminating because it's so clear, there are so many premonitions in them. And it's like he knew, or he was very aware of all of the different sort of countervailing gazes that put him in the line of fire. Um, and events like this are always really unnerving because you know that representation matters, right? And, and you think about what it means to be asked to do something like this. Um, on behalf of or in celebration of somebody like Ashraf Fayyad. Um, and so I know, for example, who I am and what I look like and what I wear and how I speak and my national origins and all of these things can easily be appropriated by anybody in order to sort of um, uh, achieve particular agendas. Um, and it's, it's terrifying um, because, you know, we're in America um, and, yeah, uh, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> so this, um, uh, this poem is called um, Code Switching in the Crosshairs, Untied Fragments of an Unfinished Thought. To be young, gifted, and Arab means hunters are looking for you to show others how to pray. And you've had to learn this predatorial relationship quickly. The medieval Islamic philosopher, physician, and poet Ibn Sina called this inner faculty of estimation al quwa al wahmiya He explained that a sheep knows that the wolf will eat it and devour it in moments without, without hesitation. And now look, I'm not one to be defending enlightenment values, and I know that it is um, nothing called, um, that there's nothing called pure reason that exists in some transcendental sphere outside of this earth, and nothing can really um, be about the universality of mankind because every man and every detail is particular and there's infinite possibilities in that one detail. But last week, a cascade of half-dead fish eyes were blinking towards me from the floor of a wooden canoe. And the relationship between me and whatever stands um, were uh, 
but between me and whatever was staring back at me were things and reasons that Descartes and um, Kant never thought of including in their version of the world. And for whatever reason, um, divine thoughts or otherwise were behind their gills opening and closing like struggling shutters. It was also not included in Ibn Taymiyyah or um, Iman al-Ghazali's version of the world either. And all the while these fishes were staring at me and I'm wondering why is it that all these men around the world today and back then um, were so uncomfortable with difference or they pretended or apprehended that it was not even there. And the fishes fighting for oxygen became my sustenance um, because there is no, di there is no denying that um, living, the living quite literally feed off of the dead. But I touched them with my fingers and I sensed the slime under my nails and I accidentally swallowed their bones and that is why the sheep does not need to, uh, to be taught that the wolf is dim-wittingly carnivorous and the body knows what to be afraid of and that knowing and that fear is part of the soul and those fishes soul, have souls too, and they became a part of me. And that is still in the world, and they are still in the world. And that is why when Ashraf Bayad said, you too should, for, should never forget that you too are a piece of bread, that it means something. Two, to be young, Arab, and gifted means that you gotta stand um, in dark corners like a ninja. But at the same time, you gotta be afraid that people are gonna think about ninja and say, oh, look, these people are lying. And this means having to change hats like shuffling a deck of cards. And this means that taking a lot of, um, um, taking a lot of um, time just to say that um, you become quite liter, wait, sorry. To be young, gifted, and Arab is to know that you, that that word can very easily be changed to Palestinian and can very easily be changed to Muslim and can very easily be changed to the origin which was black and to be young, gifted, and Arab means knowing that you should not ask the most obvious common sense questions like what is it to you how I pray and what I wear on my head and who I love and what it is and who and what it is that I'm accountable to. And today, to be young, gifted, and Palestinian, or to be young, gifted, and Muslim, or Arab, or black, means that even if you don't ask these questions, even if you do answer all of the, all of the questions correctly, um, that still the wolves will um, look for every reason and means to remind you that you are nothing of that primordial fear, that you are nothing but a piece of bread. Three. To be young, gifted, and Arab means that they are positioning you in the crosshairs and staring you down just above the barrel of their guns. And, you can't, and they can't humor you with enough time to try to apprehend the truth of what it is that they're asking. So you learn for shorthand, uh, you learn shorthands um, for questions that they ask you. Um, for example, at the, the Israeli border patrol, uh, Israeli border security, you answer, yes. Um, I, uh, yes, uh, Walter Benjamin, okay. So at border, at the border, at the Israeli border security, you do say, yes, I was in Ramallah for a Walter Benjamin conference. And yes, Walter Benjamin was a Jewish philosopher. But then you can't really explain whether or not he was Jewish or not Jewish and what they're doing in Ramallah asking about a Jewish philosopher, for you, Israeli, um, the, the Israeli border security means um, when they ask you whether or not you're Muslim, you say, well, yes, but then you can't really go into whether or not what that means. And, and yes, you do explain that you don't um, believe in ISIS or in Boko Haram and that you don't know why you don't wear the hijab because it's a complicated question. Um, and um, but 
but at the end of the day, you will st you'll tell them whatever the hell they want to hear in order for you to pass the stupid threshold. Um, and so sometimes you just start making up stories like, I don't wear the hijab because my father has not yet forced me into submission, um, into becoming a piece of property. And sometimes I make up stuff like, um, actually I don't wear the hijab because I, uh, I escaped this awful divorce of um, an evil ex-husband who had three wives and who would um, beat me. And so, I, um, so at night, I would devise secret plans on how to escape him and, um, and, then, and, uh, and, and then one day I just walked out and I escaped his, um, his Muslim terrorist patriarchal gaze. And I mean, after a million times of being searched and surveilled and interrogated, and after a million hours, you got to find a way to, fi to get to, to entertain yourself. And sometimes um, it means creating mythologies that not just um, entertain you, but you know, achieve your ends. And so, in class, four months before you're interrogated by Israeli border security, um, you discuss Heidegger's question concerning technology and the chalice that is undisclosed into the world. And you um, sound super smart. Um, and then what happens is you and okay, then you, then you hit up your girl from Janine on the phone, trying to talk to her about Heidegger. She says, girl, I don't care. I don't know. She tells you about the trip that she just took in the Hadid Badid after um, not seeing her family. Um, for a decade, and her father not seeing his family for 25 years, she sends you she sends you pictures of him crying in the airport, hugging his sisters. Um, and uh, then, okay, so these are certain. So I guess what I'm trying to say is these code switching. Like I'm, I'm I, what I'm trying to do is say that when you're young, Arab, and gifted, you need to learn how to code switch. And you do it at the drop of a dime. Um, sometimes not when you're in an audience full of people who are staring at you and thinking that you could just sort of like make it up as you go along. But the point is, is that you have to sort of learn these things. And if you don't, it quite literally could cost you your life. And so five is if all of these wolves want to devour us, they need to know that all that will be left in the world is that the hell they claim to be saving us from, and all they will have left to eat will be each other. Um, and that's all. Hi, my name is Daniel Skonebeck. Um, I'm going to be reading four poems by the radical Iranian poet Mehdi Mousavi, um, translated very beautifully, I think, by uh, Amir Kadem. Uh, Mousavi uh, was sentenced to nine years in prison and 99 lashings um, for what was deemed propaganda against the state. Uh, which is something I personally think is very important. Uh, and I'm going to epigraph each of the four untitled poems with uh, a fragment written by the poet C.D. Wright, who died uh, just two days ago, uh, and who was a, a sort of lifelong advocate for literary freedom of expression herself. Um, and I'm going to sort of introduce the reason why I'm doing that via um, a quick thing that the poet Peter Richards wrote about CD earlier today. If you were someone milking goats in the winter, CD Wright would send you long johns, not one pair, but two. If you were someone whose writing was being suppressed, censored, neglected, or disparaged by whichever power that be, CD Wright would not only reach out to you in a letter, but also work to change the different infrastructures so your voice could be heard both here in the United States and throughout the world. The weirdening never lets up, she said. Ergo, poets shouldn't either. 
one. Will you allow me to call your name, to slough off the previous passions of a man? Allow me, will you, to love, to lift my soul and fold it inside your sweaty palms? To be a child again, crying with no excuse again, to throw stones at a flock of birds? To become a poet again, in my room's sad corner, or no, to give you a call over the phone, sitting there with your wedding gown all wet, still waiting for me to make that call. For you, in the first chapters of your life, how shall I speak of the end of this tale? You have returned again for me to love you, and I, my dear, have no right to chicken out. The world is not ineluctably finished, she said, though the watchfires have been doused. Two. By the window, a man watched his life fade away. Pride was showing me his dominion. Eclipse was it, no. The midday sun, desolate, was sending her condolences to the sky. I would have pitied myself a bit, only if the absurdity of your world gave me a chance. Time has always crushed me under his boots, always has forfeited my turn to others. And the boy picked up the blade, slit his wrist, and the father was still feeding the imaginary child. Then came the earthquake, my eyes opened to see someone shaking me amidst the sleep. The piano stands there in the dark, she said, like a boy with an orchid, someone putting their tongue where their tooth had been. Three. To defy shattering, I petrified like a rock. Now the cranes lift me away. To a God that we are not being, all the reasons are proving what is not. Deploring a wasted bygone, we wait for a future modeled after the fossils. My honor trashes me, my friends, and my land too. Even they trash me now, my own lines of verse. A forsaken file in an archive am I. Come read me out of this layered text. It was not rain if my face looks wet, not a burden of ordained, but a dagger is in my back. Stop asking for names, this futile wordplay. Cain, too, my friend, bore the name of brother. From infancy onwards, pain by your side. Your one and only friend, pain by your side. You turned into a poet for a herd of dogs. You turned into a poet for a herd of dogs. You turned into a poet for a herd of dogs. Turned into a poet, but poetry was just pain. Poetry will not go quietly, she said. You would have to starve it out. And poetry can live on very little. And hunger and love move the world. Four. Flew away my muse from the face of this verse. The girl grew wings and flew from my house. Sparrows flew, your birds flew, and crows flew. Flew all the frozen fingers when my name was called. The sparrows flew away, and the monster of sorrows invaded the nest of my dreams like a vulture. This melody is the malady of missing you that popped out from my pack of Valium. Since the mailman, the white dove, was long dead, words turned into wings, and my messages flew away. Thank you. Every bit of liquid that I drank since I left home at 2.30 this morning, afternoon has gathered in an inopportune way. And uh, as I sat there listening to everybody, I was so moved that I feel like all the blood has rushed to my heart. And so if anybody wants uh, ice for their drinks, I have 10 cubes here in my hands. Uh, listening to, uh, it was, Obviously, it's an honor to be here, and like Dred said, uh, it is also sad that we have to gather in this way. Listening to what uh, he said, I thought about, about, about revolution in places that have terrible things happening, like Saudi Arabia and in Palestine. I was 
it made me uh, think about this country and how um, it is a country which has the largest number of incarcerated children in the world and uh, where we have a 12 year old boy who can't play with his toy gun in a park in Ohio, but we have 40 year old white men occupying public lands and being allowed to receive snacks that they forgot to bring. Um, and I, uh, I bring that up because a lot of the things that we become comfortable with in this country are what we allow to make it okay for us to permit similar things to happen in other countries, including in Palestine, where uh, a great many children are in jail, and where a young girl who is walking through a checkpoint with a box of crayons is shot and killed, but settlers walk around with machine guns. And um, a lot of the writers in the anthology that I put together talk about these connections, they make that leap, which is actually, could be considered complex, but is actually not that complex. And if we took the trouble to think about it a little. Um, four of the writers from that anthology uh, spoke here today, including Dina and Lawrence and, um, and Dranya. Um, and I think about how many of those writers struggled with how to articulate what they felt. Many of them felt they didn't have the information or they didn't have the right words. Um, they, they didn't feel competent uh, or ha felt they did not have the authority to speak. But they found a way through that, uh, as we are doing here. Um, you know, I was listening to the way we forget our words, we, our voices falter. And, but when you think about the fact that we are gathered because of life and death situation for someone, in this case Ashraf, or in the case of these uh, writers in the anthology for Palestine, our awkwardness and our tremulousness is insignificant because what is really important is the sound of our voices. Um, David Bowie uh, died last week and both Rob Spillman and I talked about uh, how his music affected us and I am sure nobody forgets him singing over a wall that we thought was going to stand forever in Berlin. Um, similarly, the Palestine Festival of Literature brings poets and writers, several of whom also appear in the book, to Palestine so they can speak about the things of life and their voices reverberate over walls that seem similarly like they will stand forever and we hope will not. Um, and those voices reach people, Palestinians, inside Palestine as well as those in exile all over the world, including someone like Ashraf. Um, the poem that I um, chose to, two poems that I'm reading from today, are from Fadwa Tukan, who's a Palestinian, early Palestinian poet who lived through the Nakba and whose work uh, um, informed, influenced the young Mahmoud Darwish. And the interesting connection here is that her, her work is published in the United States by Grey Wolf Press, which also publishes me. And it has been translated from the Arabic by Naomi Shihab Nye, whose work also appears in Extraordinary Rendition, American Writers on Palestine. The first of these is called Enough for Me. Enough for me to die on her earth, be buried in her, to melt and vanish into her soil, then sprout forth as a flower, played with by a child from my country, Enough for me to remain in my country's embrace, to be in her close as a handful of dust, a sprig of grass, a flower. This second poem um, is, was written, it's called To the Imprisoned Singer, and it was written for Kamal Nasir, who was a famous Palestinian journalist and poet and writer who was exiled from Palestine and was killed in Beirut in 1973 in an attack that uh, is said to have been perpetrated with the participation of Ehud Barak, who was dressed up as a woman at the time as a soldier for the Israeli occupation forces then. To the imprisoned singer, to Kamal Nasir. 
Your singing soars to us despite the narrowness of the sky. Imprisoned bird, sing forth from behind the walls of suffering and night. The iron bars that shape the sky before your face will not keep your singing from our ears. Sing, bird, sing. The road of hope still stretches, brilliantly lit, despite the darkness around us. Your singing, bird, returned me to the past, when your feet and wings were free, when the jasmine bower embraced us, and you sang the poetry of hope and pride and strength. Even the stars leaned low to hear your song. And we felt as green and fresh as our pastures, as our mountain slopes filled with roaring wind and pride of our mountain peaks. Sing, bird, sing. Despite the chains and darkness, the horizon still offers its rich line of hope, awaiting the sun from behind the smoke. Glory to sunlight, never despair, and freedom will find victory. Tomorrow, in the homeland of our dreams, never say our dreams are lost. I like that poem because it speaks to the fact that we are writers gifted with imagination. We are not required to take the world as it is presented to us and imagine that that's how it has to be. We are allowed to dream and hope that it will become a different place. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you to all the readers for the, those wonderful, powerful words. I just want to echo what Rue said a little bit. Uh, I grew up in Berlin, and, uh, and I also just came back from two weeks in Palestine. And it is so incredibly important that all of you raise your voices for those that cannot raise voices. I am also the chair of the Penn Membership Committee. So if you are not a member, or if you have any questions about um, how you can help, how you can be involved, please do so. And uh, please stick around, see the Edgeprop, uh, amazing Edgeprop um, show here. And thanks once more to all of our wonderful readers. There's also a bar right over there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. On behalf of the Brooklyn Museum, I want to thank you all for coming and joining us tonight to honor and stand in solidarity with Ashraf Fayyad. Thank you.